Okay, welcome back everyone. This is AP Biology Unit 1. So the first episode of AP Biology Complete Review. I'm the AP Tutor, and let's get started. Okay, so what are we going to cover? Uh, so how we're going to cover this unit is by looking at what AP College Board has set up for us. They've already given us the unit along with the subunits that are going to be part of it. And I'm just going to go through each of these units and explain each one in a little bit of detail. Alright, so let's start with Unit 1, Structure of Water and Hydrogen Bonding. So let's look at some properties of water. Water is highly polar. It has a negative oxygen and two positive hydrogens. The molecules are actually held together by hydrogen, hydrogen bonding, the strongest IMF. The next slide actually talks about hydrogen bonding a little bit more in detail. Water also has some special properties. Uh, water has a high specific heat. That high specific heat is the amount of heat a substance must absorb to increase one gram of that substance by one Celsius, one degree Celsius. Water does not heat up fast and therefore provides a stable environment for species. If water heated up very fast and like cool down super fast, then no ocean animal could adapt to that change. It also moderates the climates of nearby land. As you know, the currents that move throughout the Gulf of Mexico or even into northern Europe, these currents actually regulate the, the temperature of the land nearby by bringing heat from one location to another. Water also has a high heat of vaporization. It means it needs a lots of energy to vaporize water or turn into a gas form. That's why this is good for sweating because when we sweat, the water is on our skin. It actually absorbs the heat off our skin. And when it gathers enough heat, it will vaporize into gas and then the heat will leave off into the atmosphere. Water is also a universal solvent. It's highly polar, so it dissolves polar molecules and ionic substances. Water exhibits strong cohesion tendencies. It strongly attacks, attach, attracts to each other. Um, transpiration is through the pool of cohesion, so molecules actually attracting to each other, which pulls the water up all the way through trees, all, all the way through trees, and evaporate through the leaves. Remember, this is because of the solute potential, and as solute potential decreases as we go higher up a tree into the atmosphere, which has the lowest solute percent potential of all, that water is actually going to be pulled up through that tree into the leaves. Capillary action is the combined forces of both cohesion, so water molecules attract to each other, and adhesion, so water molecules attracted to the surroundings, like the inside of a plant or the stem leaves. Surface tension is the water's ability to actually hold together. So you've probably seen those uh, water gliders which actually can stand on water. These They take advantage of the surface tension and use that to be able to walk on water. It also becomes less dense when it becomes a solid. It's the only substance to do so. Um, the molecular structure of water causes it to expand when frozen, and this allows ice to float and allows the creatures inside to survive. The water entirely froze over, obviously no animals could live in there. And then when it melts, it becomes denser and therefore falls to the bottom, causing the water and nutrients to circulate through the lake known as the spring overturn. This is because the Snow obviously melts in the spring, and then the overturn or the cycling of nutrients occurs. Okay, so like I said, a little closer to hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding, contrary to the name, is not an actual type of bonding. It's a strong attraction between molecules that have hydrogen uh, bonded to our nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. These are just highly electronegative, and therefore, they, they, this is the strongest intramolecular force, which basically means uh, an inter intermolecular force is forces that allow two atoms to actually stick to each other or stay together without actually bonding. And it makes a lot of water, pro lots of properties of water. Okay, so elements of life. So a very simple answer. Carbon. So, and nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. But you have to know that all organic molecules have carbon. This is actually one of the most essential um, elements in life. Of course, this is not it. So we will be continue talking through, talking about this through our study of different bio macromolecules, which is our next unit. So the introduction to biological macromolecules. So the things we need to know before we can get into uh, the macromolecules, such as um, what's it called, uh, carbohydrates and proteins and lipids. So first we need to know atomic structure. So atoms are built of proteins, neutrons, and electrons. Uh, remember, the atom is that the different elements are determined by the number of protons they have. The ground state of an atom is when it has no energy, and the excited state is when it has it when it's energized. Isotopes are atoms of an element, but with 
different number of neutrons. So again, each atom is defined by the number of protons. It can have different number of neutrons and still classify as the same element. Some radioactive isotopes have a half-life or decay rate. Um, ra radioisotopes, which are radioactive isotopes, no wonder, can be used to diagnose or treat diseases or act as a tracer to trace the path of a mo molecule through the body, which is kind of cool as since they're constantly giving off energy, you can actually trace them while they pass through the body based on someone who maybe ingested them or uh, breathed them in. Second is bonding. So energy is released when a bond forms. It's an exergonic reaction, creating a stable configuration, forming the complete outer shell. So if you look at the periodic table, we know that um, alkali metals, they have one electron in their outer shell and the noble, or noble gases have all eight, so they won't react. But um, the one before that, I forget what, what it's called right now, but they have seven electrons in their outer um, in their outer valence shell. So these seven outer valence shells and one outer valence shell actually bond together, forming a stable octet or eight valence shells. Ionic bonds, um, they form from the transfer of electrons. So they form anions, a negative ion, which is a nice way to remember it. Uh, these gain electrons and then a caution or a plus ion that loses an electron. Covalent bonds form when atoms share electrons, resulting in molecules. They share equally in nonpolar bonds between diatomic molecules like hydrogen, like H2. But they share unequally in polar covalent bonds when one has a greater electronegativity. Like in water, where the oxygen actually holds onto the electrons more tighter than the hydrogen do. That's why the oxygen is negatively charged and the hydrogen is positively charged, because the electrons are closer to the oxygen. Okay, second thing you know is polar and nonpolar. So when something is polar, it has it's unbalanced with different charges. So uh, like a positive side and a negative charge side. And nonpolar means it's balanced or symmetric where the charges cancel out each other. Hydrophobic and hydrophilic substances. Hydrophilic are water-loving substances. And hydrophobic are water-hating substances. Plasma membrane is a uh, phospholipid bilayer. And it's the only nonpolar, and only nonpolar substance can, substances can pass. Uh, plasma membranes, as we'll talk about later, are made of phospholipids, uh, which is a type of lipid. No wonder. Okay, pH. So uh, pH is measured as seven is equal to neutral. Anything greater than seven is an alkaline or basic, and anything less than seven is acidic. So uh, pH is measured on a base ten scale. Uh, so for example, pH one would equal to one times ten to the negative. Uh, negative 1, while pH 2 would be 1 times 10 to the negative 2, and it continues all the way down to 14. So changes to the body pH can be harmful, and the presence of buffers or substances that resist the change of pH in our body prevent this change by absorbing and releasing hydrogen ions. Humans buff the human buffer is called is a bicarbonate ion. It keeps the blood at relatively 7.4 pH. Isomers. So remember we talked earlier about um, isotopes. So isomers is it's the same molecular formula. So for example, um, SO2, but it has different arrangement of those atoms. So those atoms are in different areas, not the same as usual. There's three types: structural isomers, which differ in the arrangement of atoms, so like the order at which they occur. Cis transesomer, which differ in the spatial arrangement around double bonds, typically, which aren't at all flexible, so they might locate, they might occupy different region in the in space of 3D, and then entometers are molecules that are basically mirror images of each other. They're called left-handed and right-handed. Uh, researchers try both ways to figure out if it's more or less effective. In drug testing, typically sometimes an isomer of a molecule can actually have different effects than the actual molecule itself. Whew, we're almost done, I promise. 1.4 and 1.5 is properties of bio biological macromolecules and structure and function of biological macromolecules. Now I just put these together because they're pretty similar, so we can knock them all out at once. Okay, carbohydrates. So carbohydrates consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, below is actually an image. Let me get my laser pointer. This is an image of a simple carbohydrate or glucose. It has a carbon ring. So th the ratio to hydrogen to carbohydrates, or yeah, hydrogen to carbon. I think this is like carbon is always the same. Uh, the classes of carbohydrates 
are equal to monos are monosaccharides, which consist of one molecule, uh, C6H12O6. This ratio will always stay the same. And it has one molecule. These include glucose, galactose, fructose. These are all types of monosaccharides. Uh, disaccharides are consistent of two monosaccharides. If I'm saying this wrong, it's just because my throat is super dry. Okay, so two monosaccharides joined together. Uh, dehydration synthesis or condensation is how two monosaccharides bond into a disaccharide. You'll need to know this. It's uh, H2O or water is released and then the two molecules will bond. When they're taken apart by hydrolysis or the adding of water, um, you break down this disaccharide into monosaccharide. And polysaccharides, so you guessed it, it's macromolecules formed by many monosaccharides. Whew. Okay, lipids. So um, lipids are hydrophobic, so afraid of water, and they're not soluble in water because they're afraid of it. Contains, it contains one glycerol and three fatty acids. Glycerol is an alcohol. Fatty acid is a hydrocarbon chain. So if you see this image over here, this glycerol is actually an alcohol, and this, these three things are fatty acid chains. Uh, so the fatty acids, if they're made of hydrocarbon, so um, each of these is a carbon and stemming off of it will be hydrogens. And um, so you, they're either saturated, which um, they have all single bonds. These saturated fats are typically bad for you and they're solid at room temperature. Or they can be unsaturated where they have at least one double bond. That's all it takes, one double bond to become unsaturated. These are good for you. Uh, it doesn't have as many hydrogens and it's liquid at room temperature. Okay, and steroids are a type of lipid, uh, but they have different structure. Okay, so what are the functions of lipids? Well, they they act as energy storage. One gram of lipid equals nine calories. Uh, they act as structural, uh, helps in structure. Phospholipids create the cell membrane. Uh, chlor cholesterol, I still messed it up. A steroid is an important component of plasma membranes. The amount of cholesterol actually determines the fluidity or rigid, rigidity Rid, I can't say that word, but you know what I mean, of the membrane. And we'll talk about that later in the next unit, or few, yeah, next unit, where we talk about cell membranes. And then endocrine is some steroids are hormones. Uh, phospholipids, they're modified lipids with two fatty acids, or hydrophobic tails, and phosphate plus glycerol, so hydrophilic heads. Um, they form the phospholipid bilayer for all plasma membranes as tails go from inside and head on outside. That made that made a little sense. So let's look at this um, diagram. You can see the phosphate, uh, the phosphate head and glycerol along with the fatty acid chains. This is an unfat, unsaturated fatty acid and you can see that this kind of bends over a little bit. This actually allows for fluidity in the membrane. The more unsaturated flat fats, the more fluidity or more movement the uh, phospholipid bilayer can actually take or the cell membranes. Um, and the more saturated, the less. Again, cholesterol also increases this um, rigidity. Okay, proteins. So uh, function of proteins are include enzymatic proteins, which uh, are basically enzymes and they selectively accelerate chemical reactions in the body. Uh, storage proteins, where they store uh, amino acids. Hormonal proteins, which um, they coordinate the organism's activities like growth, puberty, etc. And a good example is insulin, which regulates our blood sugar. Defensive proteins, so they protect against disease, antibodies, transport proteins, which transports things like hemoglobin transports oxygen, receptor proteins, uh, it responds to chemical stimuli, uh, structure proteins, which help for support like keratin in the hair, polypeptide chains, uh, which are formed by linking of amino acids through peptide bonds. A uh, peptide bond is just a bond between an amino acid and a carboxyl group. Um, it consists, proteins consist of amino, as, uh, amino, carboxyl, and R group. As you, as you can see here, the R group is right here, the amino, and the carboxyl. Or sorry, carboxyl, and then amino group. Okay, uh, the R group determines the protein and its properties. So uh, there's 20 different R groups, which correspond to the 20 different amino acid, and um, the R group that's formed actually determines the properties of that um, protein. And then dipeptide. Uh, it's a molecule containing two mole er, it's a molecule containing two molecules consisting of two amino acids. Okay, so the conformation of protein or the shape is determined by the job it performs and how it functions. There's four levels or structures versus primary. Uh, primary is the protein's linear sequence of amino acids like valines, cytosine, 
blah blah blah. Uh, a slight change could actually lead to major consequences. Sickle cell anemia is just a switch of valine for glutamine. Secondary, uh, it results from hydrogen bonding with polypeptide molecules. Uh, so it folds into either alpha helixes, which uh, if I can draw that for you, is like alpha helixes go like this. Oh, sorry, that's a beta plated sheet. And then alpha helix is something just a bit different, but it's basically the linear conformation of that folding. And if it's either or both, it's called a fibrous, fibrous protein. Tertiary is the 3D shape of the protein and is determined by specificity. The tertiary structure is actually formed from many secondary structures. The contributing factors of the tertiary structure is the hydrogen bonding between the R groups. So like, like I said earlier, the properties of the R groups actually determine how it's going to shape. The uh, hydrophobic, hy ionic bonding between our groups, hydrophobic or hydrophilic interactions, and Van der Waals interactions. Van der Waals interaction is just that the temporary location of the electron while they're spinning into atoms can actually attract or repel. So weak short-range electrostatic attractive forces between uncharged molecules arising from the interaction of permanent or transient electro electric dipole moments. This just means that. As each atom has uh, has electrons running across it, running through it, sometimes those electrons both will end up. If say if two atoms are next to each other, they're not attracted to each other. But if both if both electrons are in the right place at the right time, it'll create a short term charge which will bring those two molecules together. Disulfide bond between cytosine and amino acids also determines tertiary structure. The finite quaternary structure is just made up of a bunch of tertiary structures and multiple polypeptide chains. Okay, lastly is nucleic acids. Okay, so RNA or ribonucleic acid and DNA or sorry, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, these acids consist of polynu polynucleotides called nucleotides, and they consist of a phosphate, five carbon sugar, either ribose for RNA or deoxyribose for DNA. DNA, holy, and nitrogen bases. So it, uh, it consists of pyrimidines which the pyrimidines are C, cytosine, thymine, and uracil, uh, which are six member rings, and purines, which is adenine and guanine, which are six member rings fused to five member rings. So basically what I'm saying is DNA and RNA both have a phosphate backbone and a five carbon sugar or six carbon sugars. Uh, both of them have bases. Let me see what the next one is. Okay. Both of them have bases um, A, G, T, C, and U. Or, sorry, DNA is made of A, G, T, C, while RNA swaps the thymine for uracil. Uh, these these bases actually determine what the code what the DNA is coding for. The pyrimidines, uh, cytosine, thymine, and uracil are six member rings. That's why they're called pyrimidines. And adenine and guanine, guanine are purines, which are six member rings fused to five member rings. They they're numbered one to five and three to five bonding ends. They run anti-parallel to one another. The functioning groups are the components and molecules involved in the chemical reaction. Okay, and that is it. Thank you guys for listening. I hope that helped. Please subscribe if you can. That helps a lot for me. And see you guys next time.